So we've now been able to translate this to clinical practice, taking a severely damaged human lung and over time treating it to make a lung that is transplantable. We took this into the operating rooms. We got our nurses involved in how we should set it up, the timing, the length of the tubing, to keep things sterile, the instrument trays and everything, all of the little details that we need. Again, Marcelo Soto, who's the fellow who worked with me that pioneered this work, and Jonathan Young, who's currently doing his PhD in the lab, again, able to translate what they're doing on a daily basis in a laboratory back into the operating room. And uh, this is the first patient that, that received the lung that, that had been on the ex vivo system. Dr. Pierre did the transplant, and Marcelo and I gave him a perfect lung key transplant. And uh, that was the patient 72 hours after his operation with a normal x-ray when he arrived in the ICU. And uh, this, this is a, a, a look down the airway. This is where we hooked up the airway. With these are the little blue sutures you can see. And you can see that it heals perfectly well with this technique. And as I mentioned, that's one of the Achilles heels of this operation. And his lung function is over 100% at a month after transplant. So now we've moved this into a clinical trial, a human ex vivo lung perfusion tube, HELP2 trial. And this is where we are using lungs where they don't meet the criteria that we can be comfortable to transplant them into our patients uh, in the standard way. And we put them in the ex vivo system. And an example of, of a lung, such a lung, is this is a lung in a trauma victim, had massive blood transfusion, the blood gases were not good, the bronchoscopy showed some edema and problems with the lung. It's just not a lung that you would think could be salvaged. We put that lung in the ex vivo system and transplanted the lungs. And on arrival in the ICU, we had a, a normal chest x-ray and a patient that did very well. Just to show you that the blood gas in the donor was 262. 300 is our cutoff historically. After one hour in the EVLP, we had 400. Four hours, it was 475. And the number you see in that ex vivo system reflects what you're going to see in the patient when you've transplanted it. So again, that reliability factor that you know what you're transplanting as opposed to waiting to see what happens. We can also take x-rays of these lungs and uh, the computer glitches aren't the biggest thing that happened here. The biggest thing was whose lung, who do we call this patient? Because who do we lung belong to? We're not the recipients. We're not the donors at that point. And how do we label them in our x-ray system? So we have patients called ex vivo number, and there's ex vivo 17. And you can see that these lungs look kind of white because they have a lot of water in them. After a few hours in the ex vivo, they start to look more black because they're recovering with air in them and the patient uh, six weeks after transplant. So many of you saw Andy Dijkstra, who was really the patient who was the first patient to take a lung that really didn't meet criteria that we fixed and felt met the criteria for transplant, and he was, I think, out of hospital in, in 12 days or 14 days after his transplant. So we've now done 22 of these uh, patients, and you can see the donor gases were four. They improved with the one for four hours, and the patients, after they landed in the ICU, had excellent lung function. So where are we going with this? I really think that the future is, is uh, going to be organ repair center. It will be very much like blood transfusion. We don't transfuse whole blood anymore. We check it for infection. We separate the components. We create platelets. We create cryo, uh, white cells, red cells, and, and then create a product that is quality controlled and stored appropriately and distributed. I think the future of transplantation will be this, uh, where we need to uh, bring the organs back to an organ repair center and then uh, diagnose them, repair them, then call the surgeons and say, we have a good lung for you or liver for Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so. And I think that you know, part of our, the value of our, our programs and our system here is we have a multi-organ transplant program. Jerry Levy and a number of people are working towards this concept to develop an organ repair center right here at UHN, first for research and then to roll it out to the whole country. And I know Dr. Seltner is here uh, from the liver transplant team, one of our surgeons, and he's already, you can see, uh, taken advantage of the knowledge we've gained and has developed a, a similar system for the liver. There are other surgeons around the world working on heart and on 
Sydney at the same time. So, so I think what we're looking at is trying to uh, develop a system of uh, personalized medicine for the organ, the opportunity to engineer better organs for transplantation to improve not only the number of organs we transplant, but the quality and safety and the outcomes of the transplants we perform. And I'd like to close by, by once again, like the, I acknowledge the clinical team is acknowledging the research team. We have a, a large number in the Latmo uh, thoracic uh, laboratories, a lar large number of research fellows, uh, PhD and master's students uh, that come to us from all over the world, our technicians and uh, my colleagues and the principal investigator that contribute to this huge amount of work that I think is, will make a uh, significant difference. Thank you very much. Hey, I'm happy to take any questions if you have any. So the, in the, the, the question is, in the perfusion system, is there a leukocyte filter, a white blood cell filter, and why do we use that? Um, one of the uh, very interesting things about lungs is, is um, when you have an inflammatory system, uh, inflammatory uh, situation in your body, uh, white blood cells or neutrophils are activated and they become sticky. And the lung becomes a very uh, potent trap for these uh, turned on cells. And when they get stuck in the lung, they cause more injury and inflammation in the lung. So part of this system is we perfuse the lungs with a solution to wash out those cells and also to coat the surface to make the surface of the lung less sticky so that these inflamed cells rippling through don't get stuck. And then we have a filter outside in the system to trap it so that they don't come back in on the way out. And we change the solution over time so that as we wash out the inflammatory mediators in the lung, uh, you, you can then, then uh, replenish it with solution that doesn't have the, the inflammation in it. Okay. The question was, does that obviate the need for cyclosporin and tissue typing? I think uh, that's a very good question, but uh, cyclosporin is, is the, the immunosuppressive medication that, that makes your T cells um, not react as strongly to foreign uh, substances. And tissue typing obviously is matching so that can you match the organ as close to the recipient and the donor as close as possible so they don't see each other as, as foreign. What I've been very interested in is trying to develop uh, tolerance before you even transplant the organ. So one of the really neat things about IL-10 is you can modify the lung to be seen as more, more like self before it even goes into the recipient. So that's our second goal. Our first goal is can you predict the function and repair the lung, and can you make it work better when you first put it in for that reperfusion injury phase? The second uh, goal is can you immunologically modify it for it being more of self? And I think that uh, this will be sparing of immunosuppression therapy and the side effects because what we're doing now is upregulating IL-10, so it's providing immunosuppression in the lung where you need it most so that you don't have to be giving immunosuppression to the rest of your body. That's exactly where we're going, and we need you guys to support us to do wild things like that. I, I think it's it's not that wild because uh, there there are several extensions of that concept. One is, for example, there are chemotherapeutic agents that are effective against certain cancers that spread to the lung, but they're so toxic that we can't give it to patients. So we're exploring the concept of saying, can we take the lung out, put it in the system, treat it, and then put it back? And I think that's a reality. The other thing is when you talk about regenerative medicine and growing new lungs, one of the things is like, yeah, you want a new lung, but while it's growing, where do you put it? Where do these cells hang out? Where do they live? They're sort of bioreactors and so on. 